topic of our conversation today is creating a verify as bill stablecoin, not a trusted one, as well as uh, many stablecoins within the space for uh, as far as collateral backed stablecoins, we've been forced to assume the level of collateral reserves, assume the the truth behind the auditing firm that's putting them there. And what I'm gonna go over today is not just uh, improving those auditing frameworks and, and writing them to chain from multiple different validators, but ultimately doing it in a way where DAOs and protocols can really trust and believe um, and verify the underlying collateral. Uh, Stablecoins have been a hot topic this year. One of our biggest market downturns was due to algorithmic stablecoin, which had uh, various lack of collateral, lack of underlying liquidity, and, and created massive volatility. So what are the main problems with stablecoins? Well, solvency was the first with Terra Luna. Um, there was a massive insolvency issue they weren't able to correct when there was market uh, volatility. Traceability is another kind of key point. You want to be able to see not just where the collateral is, but how it moves from off-chain to on-chain and vice versa, and making sure that that is clearly traceable and you can trust it. Conservation is, is also very key in stablecoins, particularly collateral-backed and algorithmic stablecoins. You want to make sure that you're not just printing money, you're not leveraging some sort of governance token to create massive liquidity on-chain. Uh, consistency, this is key because even now when you look at uh, your, the way you primarily access fiat from stablecoins and back to fiat, uh, you have to use multiple counterparties in many cases, uh, or you have to use a layer on top of the banking system, which creates um, levels of difficulty. Like in the case of Circle, if you, in their agreement, they'll specifically say that they have no fiduciary obligation to return your uh, USDC for fiat. In the case of a bank, if you're directly onboarded to a bank, that solves that problem because the bank has a fiduciary obligation to return your money, and that's critical that you have not just the, you're not just supporting the DeFi and the crypto side, but you're using the legal frameworks that exist now and using them in a means to be able to really, um, to really have that consistency back and forth. And autonomy. Uh, if you look at the three major stable coins that exist today, um, Circles with Coinbase, Paxos is Binance, US dollar, and um, uh, Tether is Bitfinex. These are really centralized on exchanges, which means that there's a lack of autonomy and there's a lack of special uh, protection against special interests. Taking that a step further, when you consider autonomy, also think of governments around the world. So if, you want, if you're in Africa and you want to use a stable coin and you want to use a stable coin that has maybe more trusted collateral like a circle, the difficulty there is you're putting your project, your business on the whims of the central bank of a di different country. Um, in our particular case, we focus heavily on leaning on uh, existing banking and risk frameworks. So if you look at the key points and how this is realized, at least in this comparison, fiat redeemable is absolutely critical, making sure that's a direct relationship between the person that is banked at a financial institution and being able to issue and redeem. Um, once you do issue a stable coin, making sure that that is you know, a non-custodial digital asset and it can move freely um, and be a borderless instrument that anyone can access on DEX and other exchanges. Price stable. Um, all the stable coins have de-pegged at least to some degree within the, recent, uh, within the recent history. Tether and DAI obviously had a bigger de-peg than USDC, but even if you're looking at like 100 million billion dollar worth of transactions, which most institutions are gonna be looking to do over time, they need to know like even a few cents, even a fraction of a cent depegging is, is too much risk. In our particular case, everything's redeemable directly at a financial institution, always for one to one. So when there's market volatility, uh, market makers would naturally use a US dollar to create a dollar at a bank account, put it to the market and, and get that arbitrage, get that difference. Um, and it's no questions asked, always redeemable at a bank. Real-time auditing, um, this is where Chainlink, uh, our partnership with Chainlink really comes into play because the way we exist right now is we focus on proof of reserves. We have a single uh, value that is written to Chain that's validated. Um, in our particular case, we're integrated to core banking APIs, so you can really see that clearly. Um, insurance, uh, we have a regulated DAO insurance protocol that will be going live next year that will open up a whole bunch of uh, counterparty risk reduction for participants. So in case there's a bank insolvency, 
uh, within our ecosystem. Um, DAO governance is absolutely critical. Uh, if you look at algorithmic stablecoins um, and even DAI, the DAO governance and the governance tokens aren't full, really decentralized. They really come to a few counterparties, even if they spread them out. At the end of the day, if one counterparty really wants to do something, one of the founders of DAI, then it, then it passes. And then TradFi yield on chain. So this is kind of the real world asset bridge. And again, is absolutely critical because when DAOs and protocols are looking to uh, expand their, uh, their collateral outside of the volatility of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, they're interested in holding treasuries and they're interested in holding credit products um, that are backed by real world assets. So Bitcoin and Ethereum fall, there's still some value that is consistent and, and able to be redeemable for uh, fiat or stablecoin on chain. This just really talks about what we are at Fluent and what we really intended uh, when we were building this is to focus on counterparty risk and open up a stablecoin to institutions around the world so eventually something they can hold on balance sheet. So there's no banks that today hold any stablecoin on their balance sheet. They issue and hold the fiat side of it um, and allow money transmitters to do the issuance and the redemption. In this particular case, we added a, a hybrid stablecoin protocol. So we have algorithmic factors like a DAO that ensures price stability, um, but also we're routed in, in real world collateral similar to the structure of what you would see the collateral circle. Um, deployed by a consortium of banks. So there's three banks in the US that we're currently deployed from um, and, and looking to expand that. We're also looking to expand to banks in Kenya, banks in the UAE, banks in Latin America, and ultimately, each one of the, we lean on these banks' risk and compliance departments, which really allow everyone to have local deposits, issue a stablecoin, um, and start to transact. Um, insured by a DAO, pegged one-to-one, -one, and forward compatible with CDBCs. Many people don't realize this, but CDBCs are leaning, heavily leaning towards wholesale, which means it's transactions between banks. So what we can really do is extend past that and help those, um, help those financial institutions bridge into retail by issuing from a wholesale system to a public network, because that's the real value prop, right? Is once you have a non-custodial digital asset is being able to send that to anyone in the world as long as you have their public key. So how do we make it verifiable? And this is pretty critical. There's three main components. We have proof of reserves, which is an existing product that, exi that is uh, done by Chainlink today and really pioneered the, the first version of verifiable um, total value of balances, and this is just a single string. Uh, then proof of assets. This is something that we're looking to build out where you can see the composition of the portfolio on chain represented, whether it's money markets, credits, fiat, you can see the composition of the full, full balance. Um, and then proof of transactions. And really interesting, you know, uh, Chainlink's uh, pilot with the SWIFT network. Um, this is in a really similar fashion, using transaction, batch transaction data to be able to write that to chain. Obviously, uh, you're gonna need some zero knowledge components to be able to maintain privacy there, but at all points, you'll have the proof of reserves written from the core banking, proof of assets, which will add up and equal the proof of reserves, and the proof of transactions, which create a, a validity and shows the movement between, um, between issuance, redemption, and settlement between the different financial institutions, and ultimately add up to equal the proof of reserves. One of the key points and why I brought up zero knowledge proofs and why this is so critical for the implementation of something like this is we all know the benefits of blockchain. Most people here probably have a pretty good background in it. But there's a lot of weaknesses when you're writing to public chain and a lot of that data like personally identifiable information cannot be written to chain for various different reasons, various different government regulations. So as regulated institutions, you want to be able to obscure that, make sure that it's algorithmically verifiable through zero knowledge proofs. So this really just allows us to maintain privacy of those other data, like proof of transactions, um, sometimes investment compositions. You don't really want those to be public either. You want to be algorithmically verifiable that they're true and they equal a certain amount, but people can game your portfolio. They can push against your lack of liquidity, um, as we saw happen recently with Terra Luna. So this just kind of high level covers proof of reserves, again, existing solution, proof of assets, being able to implement zero knowledge proofs to obscure 
uh, confidential information, but still make it verifiable, and proof of transactions. So those of you that aren't super familiar with proof of reserves, this is a very high-level schematic of kind of how it works. It starts with uh, core banking APIs in our particular case, where we stage these APIs and we allow the total balance to be written to chain through uh, Oracle proof of reserve Oracle network. And that can go to multiple public ledgers. Um, and that's the interesting thing about Chainlink is they're chain agnostic in many cases. So as we issue native stable coins on multiple chains, currently Ethereum, um, but as we expand out to others, the benefit of working with a chain agnostic Oracle system is that they can do the same thing to other protocols. Now, this just kind of covers, again, a high-level flow of proof of assets. This is critical because composition of portfolio is very, very important when trying to create a verifiable solution. Um, this can be a composition of portfolio per chain. So in our particular case, we have a private ledger before we issue to public, and each, and other, each and individual one of those ledgers has a vault, and those vaults have a set of collateral that back them. So you can see the, the, the composition for each and every chain that the stablecoin is minted to, and you can add those up to equal the total amount of stablecoins across all chains and validate that the composition of those assets meet your requirements. Um, in, you know, in the case of USDT, um, you, know, you don't know where that credit belongs to. They have a lot of commercial credit, a lot of commercial paper, and you have no idea who that belongs to or uh, the level of risk that you're taking when you hold that stable coin. Um, in this particular case, you would be able to verify on-chain, understand the composition, and trust it. And this is critical when you're talking about Dow treasuries that have billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars that they're looking to deploy in various different products. And they need to be able to tell their community when they're holding this asset um, that it has a composition that meets the, the community's guidelines. Proof of transactions. And again, this is very high level schematics here. But the real key here is you can game a proof of reserves. You can have money. Uh, you can have different values of assets behind it. You can have uh, money moving between accounts, and you take a snapshot right before to make sure it's valid, and then you go deploy the money in a whole bunch of things and then move it back and take another snapshot. But what proof of transaction does is allows you to understand the flows of the monies, which again, when it's written to chain, makes a fully, uh, a fully verifiable solution. These three together um, really all needing each other uh, and all, act, all equaling a total that is the same across all boards allows every person to go in and verify those assets. So where we are now is we're integrating proof of reserves with Chainlink. Um, the next thing we'll be building out is proof of assets. So we'll be working uh, and evaluating various different types of market data about treasuries, whether that's through a Bloomberg or through a specific broker's API um, to give real time value of the underlying assets and collateral. Then we'll look to build out proof of transactions. This requires a zero knowledge uh, solution because you can't write transaction data to chain without having some, uh, some ability to obscure that data. And ultimately, this provides a real time zero knowledge audit solution across the board. This really opens up um, a significant amount of trust, a significant amount of benefits. But at any point in time, anyone on the public chain can go verify the underlying collateral and this, again, starts to open up that real world bridge. Because ultimately, if you look at what DAOs and protocols are really, really craving for right now, is a lot of TradFi assets. I know that's not the typical DeFi perspective. And we've been doing a lot of um, yield, farm and varying, uh, yield farming and various other solutions. Uh, but being able to take that, guarantee them 4% yield on a treasury, and then being able to represent that on chain to their community, has been one of the, one of the biggest, uh, biggest demands right now. And so once we have this real-time audit solution, that is completely streamless, completely um, validatable at any given time. So um, that's my general presentation. I have some time for questions. If anyone wants to ask anything, I'm happy to, to address a few of them. No? Oh, go. Hi, um, it's my first time here, US Plus and Fluent. Uh, so my question is that, uh, do you guys have your own blockchain? Or? 
So um, we were largely in stealth for a long time, for obvious reasons. We have really big competitors and actors in the space, so we wanted to make sure we built out all of our infrastructure. Um, but we do not have our own blockchain, per se. We have a private blockchain that we use for real-time growth settlement between the different financial institutions that we're integrated into. Then we have a set of smart contracts, and we mint natively on public chains. First, Ethereum. We have a really good relationship with Cardano. Um, we've started discussions with Avalanche and a few other really, really critical chains that need native stable coins, but also need to be able to operate outside the U.S. Uh, and have a bank and be reliant on the banking local banking frameworks to be able to do so. Oh yeah. Um, and my second question is that uh, you're talking about you use zero knowledge proof to prove like the proof of reserve and proof of assets and all this process. Uh, what algorithm exactly you guys use? So, oh, I mean, have to ask. I mean, what's the name of that? That So we use Peterson commitments for this, um, and there's a, the base of it is a paper published by MIT uh, the, uh, on the CK Ledger, uh, and some of the concepts behind it uh, are published here now. That's pretty much the basis of it. It's under evaluation peer uh, review, and that is the foundation of it. Of course, we, we take any input, uh, and eventually we're going to make this public as well. Uh, thank you for your answering. Of course. I think we're, uh, we're at time. Good. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, it was really great to come here and talk to you about what we're building and the intent of really uh, partnering with uh, Chainlink to provide the most verifiable stablecoin on any layer one. So appreciate your guys' time and have a great day.